A warm welcome to all participants, IEPA members and IEPA friends. Thank you for joining us at this online presentation organized by the Australian Institute of Polish Affairs. My name is Gosia Klat and I am a current president of IEPA. Before we proceed, I would like to make some introductions. First, let me acknowledge the elders, families and descendants of the indigenous people who for many generations have been custodians of the lands on which we are organizing this meeting today. I acknowledge the first people of the base, the Boon Wurrung peoples of the Kulin nation, where I am currently located. We are extremely fortunate to host a distinguished politician and author, a member of the European Parliament and the former Polish Minister of Foreign Affairs, Radek Sikorski, in an online event that explores Poland's contestation of the EU rules, as well as political consequences of this contestation. In a moment, I will ask Professor Jan Pakulski and IEPA's Vice President to introduce our guest. But first, I would like to introduce shortly IEPA and the context for this special event. Our Institute is an independent, voluntary and a non-political organization with almost 30 years of tradition of building stronger ties between Poland and Australia by inviting expert speakers, arranging lectures, as well as celebrating important milestones and historical events. AIPA first and foremost is an organization driven by significant values recognized by international organizations such as human rights, equality, democracy, and freedom. Therefore, the recent ruling of the current constitutional tribunal rejecting the supremacy of the European Court of Justice and the following debate in the European Parliament have been central in the recent discussions about the future of Poland and of the EU itself among uh, our institute members. Within this context, we have sought Radek Sikorski's expertise in providing our community with more details about the current situation and possible effects of these judicial developments. Janku, over to you to introduce our guest. A very warm welcome uh, to uh, one of the most recognized and best known and most popular Polish politician, journalist, author, uh, as well as uh, a great shaper of the foreign policies in the European Union, in Poland, European Union, and worldwide. Uh, uh, Radek Sikorski uh, is a member of the European Parliament. He was also a uh, marshal of the Polish Sejm uh, in 2014-15, which is the third most powerful position uh, uh, in Polish politics. Uh, but his major impact uh, is in the areas of uh, foreign affairs. He was minister in, uh, for, of foreign affairs in Tusk's cabinet uh, between uh, 2007 and 14. Uh, and uh, uh, from 2019, he's been a member of the uh, European Parliament. W while uh, working as a minister, he reformed the diplomatic service in Poland to revolutionize it, really. Uh, and uh, he was the uh, major architect together with uh, Karl built of Eastern uh, Partnership, a very important uh, policy initiative uh, of uh, European Union towards the East European countries. He was also supporter uh, of the Weimar Triangle, a very important initiative uh, when Poland together with France and Germany emerged as a key leader of the European, de facto leader of the key European Union. Those were the days. Uh, and also um, advocate of democratization and close links with Ukraine and the advocate of democratization 
in Russia. And after the failure uh, of uh, democratization process, a major advocate of sanctions against Putin violations of uh, uh, good manners and policies. He is also uh, a negotiator. He was also a negotiator of agreement with the U.S. on stationing uh, missile defense base in Poland uh, and advocate of the pan-European energy plan. Um, uh, educated in Oxford, in Pembroke College, uh, uh, senior fellow uh, at Harvard University Center for European St Studies, and probably uh, very importantly for us, also uh, one of the most widely recognized Polish politician, internationally and nationally, uh, elected uh, uh, as a member of the very exclusive club of the 100 most influential politicians and intellectuals. So very warm welcome, Radek Sikorski. And uh, uh, could you comment on uh, this process of contestation uh, by Polish peace authority of the, uh, not only legal order, but also political and moral order uh, of the European Union, because it involves also contestation of the major values, which uh, is so uh, clear uh, the current crisis on the Polish-Belarusian order. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm speaking to you from London, so I suppose I should also acknowledge uh, the people who uh, ruled here before, uh, since we're in the former Roman province of Britannia. Um, uh, the, you know, the Celts, who were so cruelly conquered by Caesar and Claudius, and then the Brits and the Anglo-Romans, uh, who uh, fell under the uh, invasion of the Normans. But here we are now in this renegade pro former province of the European Union, uh, which I think is beginning to regret uh, uh, that fateful decision. The uh, uh, British exports to the continent are dropping uh, to uh, Germany. They've dropped by 11% for the first half of this year, while German exports to Britain have actually risen. So I hope that gives our uh, uh, government in Poland some pause for thought in their anti-EU uh, propaganda and actions. Um, I can, of course, um, discuss with you each issue one by one, each challenge uh, to the um, EU order and Poland's place in the EU. But I'd like to put to you that Fundamentally speaking, if you accept uh, the PIS government definition of sovereignty, then it's hard to predict on which particular issue uh, Poland will diverge from the EU, but the divergence itself is inevitable. Because let's, let's think big about this. I define sovereignty can be defined in various ways. It's the uh, monopoly of use of force on a given territory. But in, in terms of foreign affairs, it's the ability of the state to voluntarily negotiate and enter into treaties. So communist Poland wasn't sovereign because if we'd wanted to leave the treaty on on, on the Comic-Con or on the Warsaw Pact, uh, we would have been treated the way the Hungarians and the, and the Czechoslovaks um, were treated when they tried to do that. Whereas in the EU, clearly it can be done because the British, for example, have left. Um, but once you, you voluntarily enter into a treaty, and I, I, I don't mean just an EU treaty, any kind of treaty. It means that you pledge in any given situation 
to uh, act according to what the treaty says and not according to your whim. Whereas they define sovereignty as the ability to act uh, independently of any international obligations, irrespective of signed treaties. Yeah. The Polish expression is wolność Tomku w swoim domku. Well, on that basis, you sh we shouldn't be NATO either, because the NATO treaty says that if any one uh, member gets attacked, uh, we treat it as an attack on ourselves. Well, you know, obligation to, to go to war is as big a, 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 um, a check, a, a limitation on, on sovereignty as you can imagine. Um, and let's also remember that treaties uh, are not some kind of external gorset. They are part of domestic law. If you negotiate a treaty, it then goes to parliament. Parliament votes sometimes by, by uh, an ordinary majority, sometimes by a supermajority to allow the president to ratify it. Then the president ratifies it. And it's just like any other law in, 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 in the Polish uh, legal system. More than that, the constitution itself says that when there is a conflict between a ratified treaty and domestic legislation, the ratified treaty takes a precedence. And we now have a government which has taken over, has taken under a party control, uh, the Constitutional Tribunal, which has the effect that ordinary legislation has the force of uh, the change of constitution because the, there's, there's no uh, body that can challenge that. And um, when it's inconvenient to abide by the treaty, uh, just in the last couple of days, the uh, uh, justice minister has asked the constitutional tribunal to, to uh, whether the uh, uh, European um, Treaty on Human Rights is uh, is compatible with the Polish Constitution. Um, the Polish government pretends that it's taking itself uh, from underneath the treat the parts of the treaties that it doesn't like. So it's it thinks it has given itself the right to abide only that those parts of the treaties that that, that are agreeable. Now, I put to you that this is not just a legal challenge to the EU. This is not, a, 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 as they would like to portray it, a, an academic dispute over the relationship between national constitutions and national constitutional tribunals and the EU tribunals and EU law. It's much more fundamental. This is an existential issue for the EU because you have to take the Kantian perspective uh, in, in establishing a principle. What would happen if that principle were adopted by everybody else? And if everybody else starts applying European treaties as they see fit and not uh, as they agreed, the European Union is actually impossible because the whole edifice depends on everybody recognizing a key community, the 80,000 pages of, of common legislation. And, and I don't mean it in some kind of high-flown constitutional way. I mean it in the most practical sense. The core of the European Union is the single market. Would you close? And, um, and the single market is only possible when all the institutions of all the member states are equivalent and trust one another. 
including the courts, of course. Because think about it. This is what the British didn't understand. They thought that instead of the single market, they'll have a free trade area. And well, sounds the same, doesn't it? But it's not the same. Under a free trade agreement, you have a normal customs barrier with checks for uh, quality, for health standards, for VAT, for origin, and for um, customs, except that the customs rate is zero in the, in the paperwork. Under a single market, you have none of that. You have, you treat the whole continent as your own country's internal market. That's in fact the official name of the, of the single market, internal market. So whatever service or good you produce in one member state, it is without any further checks, veterinary, technical, health, zero bureaucratic checks, uh, and you can sell that good or service anywhere else in the single market. Now, for that to operate, the institutions have to be equivalent and the legislation has to be the same in the commercial area, because otherwise it can't work. So our nationalists think that they, are, they found a clever way of, uh, of, of, of taking advantage of the EU, getting the money and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and um, applying the um, favorable conditions to uh, Polish uh, companies, but without having to um, abide by the rules of, for example, uh, independence of the judiciary. But the EU can't let them have it because the quality of courts in any member state, state is, not an in, is not a national issue because those courts pass judgments on citizens and companies from all other member states. Yeah. Think of a French company having a dispute in Poland uh, over an unpaid bill. And if the Polish court is biased and, you know, under the Nationalist Party control says, well, between a, in the dispute between a Pole and a French, the Pole has to win. Uh, you, you can't run a single market on that basis. Or imagine that uh, Marine Le Pen wins in France and they pass a law that in France, the a Frenchman can all, all, always has to win. And there's a dispute in a marriage over custody of children. These things happen in France. And, and the Polish girl or Polish boy loses. Or there is a criminal. And there is a, 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 um, a European arrest warrant. Polish arrest warrants are already being questioned not by politicians, by ordinary judges in Holland, in Ireland, in Spain, who are asking Polish judges, did you arrive at that judgment uh, uh, independent? This is in fact a, 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 um, an institutional beginning of, pol of polexit. Um, uh, Poland is already paying the highest uh, penalty fees in the history of the EU. The clock is running very fast. It's um, on one judgment, it's uh, 1 million per day euros. On another judgment, it's uh, half a million. Uh, the commission will send the bills, but uh, it can then just charge the money against uh, what Poland is owed. And you know, in any, at any other time, this sort of thing would bring down the government. But there are so many other things that are happening that should have brought down the government, and yet they are not. Um, just cast your mind back to, uh, you know, eight years ago, what kinds of things used to be a scandal in Poland. 
And now, yeah, tens of thousands of, of people are dying unnecessarily because the government is afraid of, uh, of the anti-vax lobby. Um, you know, we are in complete diplomatic isolation so that even on an issue which the EU is begging Poland to accept its assistance, uh, I mean, the, uh, the migrant crisis on the Polish Belarusian border, you know, which, on which Poland should be in the lead. Poland should be co coordinating uh, the, the EU response to the Lukashenko challenge. And instead, uh, Merkel and Macron are, 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 are talking to Putin and to Lukashenko over our heads. Um, terrible reputation, terrible relations with France, with Germany, with Ukraine, with uh, Israel, with, um, with the European institutions, uh, with the Council of Europe, and most of the time, even with the United States. You know, can everybody be wrong? And, and, and Kaczynski, the only person who correctly uh, evaluates the international situation. In his, his, in his interview a couple of days ago, he, uh, he's saying that uh, the crisis on the border, the dispute with the Czechs, and the challenges in the EU courts are all interlinked. It's all a huge conspiracy against Poland. I mean, we have to face the fact that we are, the Poland is now run by people who are not fully rational. Perhaps I'll stop here. Thank you so much for this grim, really grim um, summary, I think. Um, so I, um, I, I have been receiving some questions, so I will start with maybe questions from the chat. Uh, the first one from Keith Harvey. Thank you, Keith, for being here. Um, are the events on the border with Bel Belarus likely to change opinions in Poland about the relationship with Europe? Um, I hope so. And I think that's why Kaczynski is blocking attempts to accept the EU assistance. Because uh, remember, just two weeks ago, they were accusing the EU of uh, fighting a hybrid war against Poland and of uh, perhaps wanting to launch World War III against Poland. I mean, have you heard anything this absurd? And Morawiecki made a provocative speech in Strasbourg um, in which he basically repeated Nigel Farage's arguments against the EU. I mean, getting the EU recovery, uh, a recovery fund was within his grasp. We were all convinced in Strasbourg that he will come, say a couple of conciliatory things, promise to uh, move a little bit on, uh, on the judiciary reforms, and by now Poland would have got the money. And instead, he, he went full Farage, full Jobro, and has made it in. The commission was ready to capitulate. They want to push out the money. <laughs> and he made it impossible for them. Um, so, so, so having portrayed the EU as the enemy of Poland, they now can't allow for the EU to be part of the solution. Uh, and that's, that's the reason why they didn't ask for help two or three months ago. You know, all the things that the EU is doing now could have been done three months ago. The EU has persuaded Iraq to close down uh, Belarusian consulates, and the EU t a week ago told um, Middle Eastern airlines that if they continue to ship migrants to Minsk, they'll lose their license uh, uh, to land in the EU, and they immediately complied. And the supply of migrants uh, is uh, diminished. And this, I think, will lead to Lukashenko eventually giving up. But instead, of course, all they want is propaganda images of, you know, of Polish uh, forces uh, battling the refugees, because uh, that's what these kinds of regimes always do. You, you either have a real enemy or you have to man create an enemy, either external or internal. Thank you. The next question uh, from Robert Czernkowski. 
Given how Hungary and Poland rely on mutual veto in the EU, what is your prognosis for? A. Orban to lose in 2022 and conditional on that, B. The ongoing relationship between Poland and the EU. Well, first of all, uh, it's it's uh, it's the Polish uh, it's it's Kaczynski who thinks he has the promise of a Hungarian veto, but Orban is a much cleverer operator uh, than Kaczynski. You know, after all, he went to my college at Oxford on a Soros scholarship. <laughs> um, and so, when push comes to shove, as in, for example, the vote to extend Tusk's tenure. Remember, it was 1 to 27. Hungary didn't vote with Poland. And let me say that the Commission has a way of, um, of persuading countries to uh, not to exercise um, veto on issues that are not its core interests. And, you know, Orban is dealing with Putin. Orban is, uh, Orban's first, second, and third interest is to stay in power rather than to keep Kaczynski in power. And he has a problem. The, um, the, the playing field in Hungary is um, very steeply um, uh, positioned against uh, the opposition. You know, the simplest definition of democracy is uh, that it's a system in which the government can lose. Well, it's very hard for the Hungarian government to lose because they have all the me there are no independent uh, um, large-scale media in, in Hungary anymore. And the resources of the state are used to uh, help the ruling party. Um, but in their third term in opposition, the Hungarian opposition uh, has united, and they've picked a, a, rather, a very clever, a regional, conservative-minded uh, mayor who seems to uh, who seems to have a chance. I don't know what the result will be because, as Comrade Stalin said, the trouble with democracy is that you never know who's going to win. Uh, I think there will be shenanigans uh, to do with Hungarians voting abroad. Uh, to do with the borders of the constituencies and so on. Um, because, you know, Orban and Kaczynski face the eternal problem of, um, of, uh, of people who have broken the law uh, and stolen. You know, it's very difficult for them to give up power because they are risking not just losing power, but going to jail. And, the, and that's a really dangerous situation because it means that they are willing to break the law further and even more dramatically. Thank you. Uh, I do not have any other questions on the chat, so please let me know. Uh, Wojtek would like to raise the hand and ask a question. I will ask you to unmute. Okay, go ahead, Wojtko. <clears throat> Well, uh, given the record of destruction of the army, foreign service, top courts, education, etc., how likely is it that peace cohort is in fact working at behest of Russia? After all, Macherevich was shown to have links to FSB as documented by Piontek. Macherevich is a, is a, a dilemma. I mean, uh, Poland was the first country in the history of NATO uh, which had, at, the, at that time, when Macierewicz was defense minister, which had a defense minister and foreign minister uh, who had had their security clearances removed by the security services. These guys did, didn't have dopuszczenie do tajemnicy, both of them stripped. Uh, by the by the counterintelligence, I mean Macierewicz, but also Waszczykowski. Um, you know, many of us are asking ourselves, you know, are the, some of these people just incompetent, uh, or is it worse? And um, I urge you to read an article, uh, an interview uh, in uh, 
in Gazeta Wyborcza, a long interview with a, a long-term Polish ambassador uh, who describes what, uh, uh, how the foreign ministry operates or rather doesn't operate. And the, uh, and the reason for the loss of quality of Polish diplomacy of the um, management of the, uh, of the armed forces and, and elsewhere is the same. Remember what was the first decision of the PIS government? It was to abolish competitive examinations in the civil service. What was their first economic decisions? decision? Was to remove a competent uh, manager of the um, stud farm in Janowiec Podlaski and appoint a, a, a PIS hanger on who brought it to a uh, to uh, bankruptcy in a couple of years. You know, this is a stud farm which survived communists and Nazis, but didn't, hasn't survived peace. And it's the same everywhere. Competent people are, are um, supplanted by peace-connected mediocrities, or worse, or thieves. And after a while, you have results. This is, you know, there was a, wonderful Polish uh, um, intellectual called uh, Kiesel, and he described socialism. It's not a crisis, it's a result. And that's what we have. When you allow idiots to run major institutions and companies, they, are, they get disorganized and they lose value. Uh, thank you. The ne next question is a big one. Um, what do you think needs to be done to remove peace from power? Well, we need to win not only with Kaczynski, we need to win with Mr. Dont, which is the counting system. Um, this is crucial. Uh, being the number one party gives you extra 20 seats in parliament at least uh, 20. So if the uh, 2019 action was um, purely proportional, peace would have 200 seats and instead it got 235. Um, so it's very simple. Uh, will it take us three terms of peace government like the Hungarian opposition? to unite, or will we be ahead the curve and will we do it in our second term in opposition? Um, and this will depend on personalities. You know, uh, I, I'm a great fan of Shimon Hovnia, but it's his first time in office. And, you know, he ran for president, he blames Platforma for not winning, the same for Kushinia Kamesh, also a very good man. And they think they will do a kind of center-right um, block uh, without a joint list uh, with civic platform. That would mean three opposition uh, blocks because there is the left as well. And that can mean that peace might not win outright, but 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 might win enough votes to form a a coalition with the uh, with the anti-European and anti-Semitic uh, Confederacy. So there's a huge and um, as far as civic platform is concerned, we are willing to make a coalition with Persel and Hovnia on almost any terms, and and we have told them so. Your decision, you know, however you want to structure the list, however you want to share out the financing, we will go along. Just let's please unite to, to get the premium uh, in terms of seats. Thank you, Radek. Uh, the next question is from Michael Svon. Um, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge Michael Danby being uh, our guest tonight as well, a former um, member of the Australian Parliament. So thank you for joining us and being interested in this event. 
And the question is, what might happen for a significant section of the Polish public to shift against the current nationalist government at the next election? When will there be a chance for Poles to vote? I think peace has uh, its peak behind it. Uh, if you look at um, the trouble is that you can't really trust uh, many of the, of the polls. And also that there is a little bit of fear in Poland now. At the last election, um, uh, Kaczynski thought he was going for a constitutional majority. Instead, he barely won. Um, he got 5% less than the opinion polls suggested. So just remember that. Um, and, you know, they've been in power for six years. They've, uh, people are tired of them. The nepotism is uh, widely um, uh, perceived. Um, I personally think that what will finish them off is the mismanagement of the economy. We have highest inflation in the EU. Uh, the head of the, cent of the central bank was, uh, was uh, trying to give them comfort on fiscal policy. Instead, he, um, he missed the moment of uh, 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 raising interest rates in anticipation. Uh, so now he's in the catch-up um, phase, uh, uh, but uh, interest rates are rising, which means uh, mortgages uh, um, are rising, uh, taxes are rising uh, for the middle class. So you have Inflation, with hit, which hits the poorest, and tax rises, which hits, uh, which is about to hit the middle class. Look, the propaganda is still unbelievable, but I think these are realities that that that, that will sink in. Thank, thank you so much. The next question is about relations with Israel. Uh, how difficult it will be to to improve those relations. Well, uh, improve. Uh, I'll be glad if they don't uh, mess them up further. Uh, if you remember at the beginning, uh, they thought that, you know, we Polish nationalists, and Netanyahu, Israeli nationalists, you know, we'll, we'll have a relationship. Uh, and uh, because we are so, you know, both good allies of Trump, of the United States, you know, we'll have a great relationship. And then they find, of course, inevitably, that nationalists uh, um, have different national interests, or at least perceive them differently. And, um, and they, against the advice of the foreign ministry, Jobro insisted on, on this uh, law that would apply externally, um, globally, uh, to punish historians if they, um, if they write uh, what, uh, what the Polish government doesn't like about the Holocaust. And, you know, the, the bill had to be amended. The negotiation to amend the bill was conducted in the uh, Vienna safe house of the Mossad. You know, they talk about us as traitors and terrorists and so on. But we don't, um, we don't negotiate Polish laws uh, with the Mossad. Um, uh, on the restitution of property, um, they should have done more explanation in Israel in anticipation. This was easy uh, to predict that it would um, uh, raise eyebrows in Israel, even though it was not an anti-Semitic law. Uh, but, you know, diplomacy is about anticipating events, and they, of course, failed to anticipate events as usual. Um, uh, and now you have these anti-Semitic excesses, you know, these guys uh, who burnt uh, the Kalisha statute uh, have been around for, for years. Uh, one of them burnt the, a Jew in effigy and uh, Jobro, instead of when he became a procurator general, moved to reduce his sentence from nine months in jail to three months in jail. And in the last few days, as I'm sure some of you noticed, the police wanted to arrest him on the spot. And the, the prosecution service uh, blocked the police only after four days and um, pressure from Israel and the United States. And 
and a, and a, and a public campaign in which I participated, uh, uh, did he allow the local prosecution service to file charges? Um, uh, so, you know, in that atmosphere, um, I don't expect an improvement of relations with Israel, also because Mr. Lapid uh, has made some, some statements which, which, uh, which were unwise. Um, and so there is now sort of ne negative dynamics on both sides. Janko. Could you comment on the state and the prospects of the uh, American-Polish relations? Well, um, you know, Poland has had a relationship with the United States uh, you know, since, since always, but let's remember that for most of the existence of the United States, Poland did not exist. And the US managed somehow. And in fact, during the 19th century from a marginal Antipodean colony uh, became uh, first a, a, a major power and then a superpower. So the existence and the interests of Poland are, are somewhat important to the United States, but not existential. And therefore, Poland has had an interest in keeping a good relationship with the US, irrespective of who is in charge in, um, in Washington. And sometimes um, Republicans have been good for us and, and, and sometimes Democrats, you know, it was uh, uh, at Yolta, it was the Democrats, but also, you know, we joined NATO under the Democrats. Uh, Reagan was, uh, was sympathetic, um, so was George, George Bush Senior, and so on. Um, uh, but the mistake that the PIS government has made was to make an ideological uh, um, alliance with Trump rather than a, a, an alliance with, uh, uh, with the United States. You know, some of, some of their decisions were really just silly. I mean, the president goes to the United States and, and announces publicly that he wants to afford Trump in Poland. And this at the time when the Democrats control the uh, House of Representatives, which has to have, give them money for it. Does it increase the likelihood that the base will be built? And, you know, a base like that is not built over one, ter one presidential term. So was it that difficult to think that the next president might not want to build a Fort Trump? I mean, these, it, it's so stupid. Um, and, and we saw the advice that the foreign ministry was giving, you know, forget the Democrats, full blast uh, for Trump. And then they're surprised that Biden, you know, might not look favorably on them. In December, after the election was called, the presidential advisor was saying, ah, the election is just the first round. The second round is in the courts and the third round in the street which means that they were willing to, to keep up the alliance with Trump, even if he had uh, held on to power undemocratically. And, you know, and they think the Democrats don't, don't hear it. So, you know, and then they're surprised that they don't take their calls, you know. It's just such um, gross incompetence that comes from provincialism, from, from, from not understanding how the world works. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I think I, we, we don't really want to keep you too much longer, um, but two last questions, one from the floor and one from the chat. Uh, Stefan Markowski. Thank you. For Thank you very much indeed. As always, your talks are very inspiring, so much appreciated. And I would like, if I may, to go back to where you started. I mean, Europe for the last 15 years has been in free fall. It is not Poland, not Hungary. It is most things. But Brexit, Greece, Euro, you name it. And the question is for my generation, 
for which Europe has been a grand project and probably the most treasured project of our lifetime. The question is how to go for a reset. To what extent people like Orban and Kaczynski in perverse way at a cost to their own countries are doing a a great job for the union because if it's to be an ever closer union, then it has to do something about it. Or is it to be a loose club, a federation of something or other? And how many decades should it take to gel? So that's the question to speculate about. Thank you. I disagree with your premise. Uh, I don't think Europe is in a free fall. The British never really belonged, you know? They joined in the 1970s when they were economically uh, in trouble, but they never really uh, accepted the political nature of the project. Uh, They never really entered, you know. Uh, I'm sure you've all at one stage or another landed at Heathrow Airport. Did you ever notice the, um, the, the signposting as you approach passport control? It was, it was, arrivals from the European Union, not within, from the European Union. (laughs) And they haven't needed to change that signpost when when they left. Um, um, And in the last, and Greece also, the meaning of Greece is different. Greece mismanaged its finances and then went through hell for 10 years in order to stay in the Eurozone. And the uh, recovery fund that uh, Poland is not getting is a huge step in the federalization of Europe. Jobro is right on this. The Germans were resisting for at least a decade the mutualization of debt. Okay. And now we've done it. Um, 750 billion euros has been borrowed collectively uh, in the financial markets by the European Commission and the member states, and the member states um, guarantee it jointly and severely and severally. Namely, that the bonds, which have a maturity of 30 years, will be paid off from either future EU taxes or from the EU budget or by the member states. This creates an unbelievably strong incentive to stay together. This is, it's not a a church marriage, but it's taking out a joint mortgage. And you know, when I hear young people these days, uh, that's the real commitment (laughs) that that they make to stay stay together. And if you look at the uh, figures for for the support of the EU after Brexit, uh, it's gone up on the continent. Brexit is not seen as a success on the contrary. Uh, And the strong support for creating a, a health union, you know, common minimum standards of care and of um, storage of key components of drugs and of key equipment and really strong support for um, for a defense union you know people can feel it in their bones that the americans are going to the far east to um uh, to to manage their confrontation with china and that the legions might lose might 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 leave and we might be on our own and we've just taken a decision uh, I've been advocating it uh, for the last two years to create a 5,000 troop um, uh, entry force uh, 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 a European uh, military unit I know it's very frustrating it's you know the wheels of Brussels move very slowly but we will outlive Kaczynski Um, and Poland should, you know, these guys in Warsaw be, behave as if Poland was a small country on which the, the rest of the EU, EU gangs up. 
actually, Poland is one of the five largest party countries in the EU. We shouldn't be in the in the committee running the thing. And we will return to that uh, position uh, if we uh, vote out the nationalists and then um, take lead of the of the uh, defense union. And we have strong arguments to do that and uh, return onto the path of joining the euro. And believe it or not, thanks to inflation, there is now more people supporting, not a majority yet, but more people support the EU than are against, uh, the, the joining the euro than are against. Because people now see that inflation is lower in the eurozone. Thank you so much. And the last question, uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't attend to all the questions from the chat, but it, it's the one that we haven't talked about yet tonight. It, it is about the role of the Catholic Church, obviously. And the question is how important is the Catholic Church support for peace to stay in power? Bye. Uh, look, this is just my personal opinion, but I, uh, the way I see it, that the Catholic Church in Poland is at peak political and financial power right now, while its base is collapsing. Uh, as, as you've probably heard, according, according to Pew Research, Poland is the country in the world with the sharpest generational divide in religiosity. Uh, people below 30 have stopped going to church and younger people are actively uh, opting out of religious classes. Um, to give you an example, in my home diocese of Bilgosz, where we have a seminary, a huge building, there are six clerics in that building. Uh, number of volunteers this year, Zero. Um, this, this is a little bit um, uh, confused by the pandemic, but I think when the pandemic is over and we again have this uh, November uh, soul counting in the churches, I think you will find a, a collapse in church attendance. And the reason for it is that the church has not reformed its feudal financial um, uh, structure. You know, you people in Australia probably don't know how it works in Poland, because in Australia and in Germany and in most countries, you know, there's a church parish which manages the finances, pays the, church, the, 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 the priest or the bishop a, a, a salary, but manages all the costs and, and does the accounts. Whereas in Poland, the priest or the bishop have completely discretionary financial power. And, and they don't even publish the accounts and there's, there's, there's zero, um, 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 what do you call it, uh, transparency. And of, and of course, in that system, you have huge um, hanky-panky with, trading land, uh, I mean, you know, you, you know all these stories. Um, and then, of course, uh, the, the, the way the church mishandled the allegations of, um, of pedophilia. But I now understand why. I mean, five years ago, if you'd asked me about this, I would have said, well, you know, like in any profession, you know, two or three or four percent bad eggs. But, you know, it's worse because it's a relationship of trust. So, of course, it should be investigated and outed and the guilty should be punished. But it turns out that the PIS-appointed pro-church committee in the European Parliament has said that one third of all cases that have been brought before it are cases of, the, of priests. And we now have the report from France. They went back 70 years to examine all the cases. I was sh shocked. There, and they discovered that there were over 200,000 victims. 
So it suggests that this wasn't a, a, a small minority of, of perverts, but something of a way of life for a lot of people. And it's shocking. And, you know, faith is a, is a is private business. But I was always of the view, um, uh, famously expounded by Edward, Edward Gibbon in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, uh, that uh, the people of Rome thought all religions to be equally true. The philosophers thought all religions to be equally false. And the politicians thought all religions to be equally useful. But I'm, I'm afraid that the church is destroying um, its moral authority. And, and, and just last thing, you know, until 20 years ago, Pol the Polish church was a national institution, meaning that when there was a problem, it could mediate. It's now become a, the ideology department of the ruling party. And I wouldn't turn to church to mediate because I know they are with piss. Um, uh, Terlikowski, a very, very brave, uh, a guy who actually seems to believe in God, um, has said that um, when the church marries a political party, it uh, usually becomes a widow in the next, uh, in the next parliamentary term. Uh, and I think this is what's going to happen. So I think we have peak church influence just before collapse. Thank you so much. Uh, I will just ask everyone to thank Radek for his very insightful responses and presentation. Thank you so much for being with us tonight and for giving your time for your Australian uh, audience and community. We, well, we don't fall off the globe uh, down there. <laughs> we, are, we are trying, we are holding tight. Uh, we are holding tight as a community of intellectual Polish diaspora as well, um, who are watching very closely uh, the events in the EU, in Poland, on the border, uh, discussing and inviting guests. And uh, please uh, remember about us and we will also be, uh, you know, um, uh, we'll uh, uh, support you from afar as much as we can. Thank you very much. Pleasure to, to see you again. Thank you uh, so much. And obviously, best wishes to your wife, Annie, as well. I'll pass them on. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Have a good day.